Hi, I'm Shoestring Jane. Welcome back to my channel where I talk about all things thrifty, frugal and money saving. And I thought I'd just come on and have a little chat about things that society tells us that we need. Things that when we think about it, we probably don't need. I've covered some of these things before, but the reason I started thinking about this was because I was thumbing through my very old copy of the Tightwad Gazette and I came across a letter because if you don't know the Tightwood Gazette, I doubt you've not heard of it if you watch my channel. This is an absolute classic of frugality, but it was a newsletter. So it's a kind of, the, these books are a collection of the original articles that Amy Decision wrote and letters from readers. And one of the letters from her, one of her readers was on the subject of baby food. And it was Patty Clark from Camden in Maine. Now this is sort of 1990s, early 1990s. Well, actually probably late 1980s because I think this came out in the early 1990s. Dear Amy, I work with mothers and infants a lot. Often they get excited about saving money by making their own baby food. Baby food, however, is what sociologists term an acquired need. While it may be the social custom to use it or expectation to use it, it's entirely the fabrication of baby food companies and it only serves to fill their pockets. It can certainly be done away with. A breastfed infant can go directly to table food when ready. I always figured if a baby needed strained peas at three months, I'd have a third one for strained peas. And I thought that is just so typical of the way we are really these days, isn't it? We really think we need things and we are told we need things and they become really kind of normal. Um, and with baby food, I remember when mine were little, I very, very rarely did I buy baby food. It was usually just to have a jar for emergencies. So perhaps in my nappy bag, I would have a jar of baby food. But I used to, at the time, I used to get baby rice and mix it up with water or milk. And I did used to use that. But actually, looking back, that was probably a mistake. And we also started feeding at that time our babies on solid food far earlier than we should have. I mean, now they say, you know, I think it's definitely no earlier than six months and probably a year you should breastfeed for. So although I did breastfeed mine for quite a long time, I did also give them solid food and I went back to work so they didn't get kind of full time breastfeeding. But I always felt that baby food was just a load of processed rubbish even then. I mean, some of it was like powder and you mixed it with water. And I just thought that looks like wallpaper paste. I'm literally never going to feed my poor child that sort of stuff. Um, I just used to get jars occasionally of the apple, kind of apple sauce, apple puree, but then thought, well, I can easily make my own. So I used to just mash up vegetables, mash up fruit um, and give them just slightly mashed, slightly lumpy, sometimes pieces of carrot and things to chew on depending on their age. And I think even then I was quite cautious. And then later, years later, when I became a childminder for a couple of years, um, I had a, a mum who used to give her little girl just whole food. This minute, as soon as she could start it, as soon as she started eating at about six months and she could pick things up for herself, she would give her like whole blueberries and she'd give her grapes, but obviously cut them up because they could be choking hazard more than blueberries. Um, pieces of meat she'd have and pieces of cheese and, and vegetables. And, and I was too cautious for that. But actually, this little child was perfectly OK eating those things. And it made me realise that I had been kind of brainwashed to think that babies couldn't deal with real food. I'm not talking about tiny babies. I'm talking about a six month, seven month, eight month old that could sit up and and eat. But I'd been brainwashed to think they needed purees at every turn you know and couldn't actually I had to come out of a jar and you know I think a lot of us were like that we couldn't just give them proper food so that's going to be the first on my list of things that we kind of think we need but we don't necessarily and if you don't know this book and this is just one of the I think there are three volumes this is just one I did have a three volume one but I gave it away silly really because I, I would I'd like to have it back now and these are quite expensive to buy but there you go. There you go. That's what I did. Um, so I've made a list of other things that occurred to me. Some of them I've mentioned before in other videos, but are worth probably mentioning again. So number two, on my list is for me personally, a gym membership or a personal trainer in order to be fit. 
I think there is this kind of misconception that we need somebody to train us or we can't get fit. We need outside help. But if you're a, a labourer or you do any kind of physical work, you're a gardener or a decorator or something like that, you'll probably never have to go to the gym because you use your body I and mean, your body is made to be used. And if you use it just in the course of your everyday activities, then you will already be fit and strong. So you won't need a gym. If like I used to, you work in an office and you have a sedentary sort of lifestyle, then you do have to make more of an effort to find ways to move your body and keep yourself fit. But you don't need a gym membership and you don't have to have a special class to go to. There are lots of ways just to use your body, just run, walk, swim, you know, do, just use your body. Um, and I've just recently finished The Salt Path and the follow-up Landlines by Raina Wynn. And they're really quite inspiring books. Um, the story is about, well, I wouldn't go into it too much because I think you need to read them. But um, basically her husband has given a diagnosis of a life-threatening illness, CBD. It's a bit like motor neuron disease, I think. Um, and they just, they walk and they walk and they walk and they walk. And his health improves just from this walking all the time they they do the coastal path and that the second one they're doing more walking and it really just using his body using his body in the way nature intended has really positive results so i think that that kind of sums up what i think anyway because i i walk probably an hour and a half a day because i've got a dog and i think i'm a lot healthier than i used to be i also do yoga a couple of times we can just do it myself i don't need an expensive gym membership from time to time i've considered going to maybe pilates or something like that but i don't really have the money and it's not something that i need to do i don't need to do that so it's another thing we tend to think that we can't get fit and strong without these kind of artificial ways of doing it and there's nothing wrong with that if you really enjoy that and if you have a gym membership membership and you can afford it and use it all the time there's nothing wrong with that i had a gym membership for about three or four years and i did absolutely love it at that point in time but um i don't think i would use it now so walking and yoga is is good enough really it's just what i need for now and number three i this always comes up any list of things like this that i do because i absolutely hate and detest air fresheners i particularly detest the plug-in air fresheners I don't like the ones you get in the car. Whenever I've had my car cleaned, uh, they always hang one of these cardboard things infused with some sort of nasty chemical fragrances, which I always just have to put straight in the bin because it's so horrible. It gives me a headache, makes me feel sick, makes me cough. But all of them are like that. I just don't understand it. These airwick type things where people tell themselves that somehow they're creating fresh air in their home and what they're doing is polluting the air in their home because it's just chemicals, it's full of chemicals. Different if you have a nice little bowl of potpourri and it's um, naturally got, I don't know, got natural fragrances in it. So maybe you've got, I don't know, some essential oils or something like that. That's different. But if you're getting these nasty chemical things, bleh. And number four on my list are expensive unnecessary gifts so really not i'm not saying that again if you can afford it if you buy some somebody something really expensive and thoughtful that they really need and they really want that i don't think there's anything wrong with that but what i'm thinking is that parents maybe not just parents but maybe you know partners they just have this idea sometimes that to show their love for somebody they need to spend a lot of money i think you don't love your kids more because you spend 500 pounds on them for every birthday or even more every birthday and every Christmas than somebody who maybe just has a much more modest budget of 50 pounds. It doesn't mean that they love their children less. It maybe means that they are not prepared to get into debt in order to shower their kids with gifts or their partner or their loved ones. It may be that they don't want their family to become really consumerist and acquisitive and just have so much stuff. It, do, it doesn't mean they love their family and their loved ones less. It means that they have a different perspective on things, which I think personally, I think we all need now at this point in time. We have a climate crisis going on. We can't afford to just 
buy more and more stuff so i think this is some kind of a societal expectation that we need to show our families how much we love them by spending a lot of money on them and i'm not saying don't buy gifts i'm just saying make them really useful keep them within your budget and don't think that you can show your love through just buying stuff and number five i find particularly on my instagram feed i can't think why but Facebook as well, I get blasted with adverts for skin creams and miracle creams of all sorts because I'm a woman of a certain age, obviously, and women of a certain age are not allowed to have wrinkles. You're not allowed to have shown that you have laughed and smiled and lived your life. You know, you've expected to be and Botoxed up to the eyeballs and it's totally unrealistic. We, we get old. If we get old, we're lucky. If we show a few wrinkles, then that's just the price of getting old. And no miracle cream is going to stop you having wrinkles. It won't reduce the wrinkles that are there. Once your wrinkles are there, you can maybe disguise them with things, but they're not gonna go away, they're there. Your skin is never gonna suddenly be as elastic as it was when you were 12 years old. It's just not gonna happen. So we've, we've totally been sucked into this and men as well increasingly sucked into this idea that all of these beauty products are going to somehow make us look different and look like a different person and not have wrinkles and not have any imperfections at all and in reality we know that that's not going to be true I mean once you've tried a few of them you know and then you spent a lot of money trying a few of them you realize they're a waste of money and you know the same with things like Botox I watched Gita Marie, I don't know if any of you watch her, um, I'll try and link the video below where she did a whole thing about Botox and also about why women, somebody said she had wrinkles, she's like 30 years old, you know, why women, but also men, particularly women, are just, just lambasted for daring to get wrinkles and daring to age. The idea that you, you have to Botox yourself up to stop yourself getting any wrinkles and actually what Botox is nasty nasty dangerous chemicals that we're pumping into our skin don't need all of those unnecessary beauty products you might need a bit of a moisturizer something to stop your skin feeling really dry when it's winter for example but you don't need to spend 100 pounds on a little pot of miracle cream and number six this might be controversial things that we don't necessarily need and i'm not saying nobody needs this this particular one but a lot of people don't a university degree and I think it was, I mean, when I grew up, hardly anybody went to university and certainly not in my circles, I came from quite a working class family. And lots of people I know didn't go to university and yet had hugely successful careers and used their talents. And I, I try to think who it was. I don't know if it was Tony Blair. There was a point in time where suddenly, it was kind of in the 90s, I think, where suddenly there was this thing from the government in the UK that everybody should get the opportunity to go to university and get a degree and I used to be married to a teacher and he used to say a lot of the kids that are going to university to do degrees are just going to get a really mediocre degree they aren't academically clever they are able in other ways they should be doing something vocational or something that uses their skills and talents more appropriately rather than just spending all their time doing A-levels and then going to university, which, I mean, it's a great experience going to university and it's a good social experience, but you can have that in other ways as well. Now, it's so expensive here. I mean, we used to get grants. When I could have gone to university, I, I would have got a grant. So we don't get grants now. Two of my three daughters went to university. The third one just decided it wasn't for her. And I think she did the right thing. She's doing really, really well at her job and she didn't need a university degree. The other two were quite academic and did want to go to university and it's something that they haven't regretted. So I'm not saying that nobody should go to university. I'm just saying that there's this kind of pressure now, this expectation that all kids should go to university and get a degree. And I think that sometimes looking at other options might be better and I think that's happening more and more now because it's got so expensive. Mine were fortunate in a way that because I was in quite a low income they got the full loan, student loan and you know take you have to earn quite a lot before you start having to pay the student loan back but if I'd been better off 
they would have got a much smaller loan. And I think it's that middle income bracket of parents that have to contribute more. And it, it's really, really can be tough, especially if you've got three kids like me. So that's one thing that I think this expectation that everybody needs a degree. And I think in reality, it perhaps devalues a degree. And obviously, there's some professions you do need a degree for, like law and medicine and that kind of thing. But sometimes getting into debt in a situation where you're not actually really properly using your skills and talents doing that, and you could be doing something more vocational for you, is better. Number seven is designer products. Designer, the idea of designer is ridiculous because really when you think about it, pretty much anything that's produced has to be designed by somebody. Just because they're not a name, it doesn't mean that they're not designer. And for my part, I come across a lot of secondhand designer goods because obviously I sell online, so I'm always looking at stuff like that. And they're not always better quality. They're really disappointing quality sometimes, which means to me that you're paying for a name. And that's what my dad always used to say. I never forgot. Paying for the name, Jane, he would say. I do think it's important to buy good quality, as the best quality of anything you can afford so that things last. So you're not just buying endless repeats of something like the obvious one is shoes, I suppose. If you buy cheap, buy twice, they say. So if you're going to buy a pair of shoes and you want the pair of shoes to last, buy a decent quality pair of shoes. They don't even have to be new, though. Get a second-hand decent quality pair of shoes. I do that very often. I just think designer products, the idea that you're paying for a Chanel handbag because it's Chanel, when you could have a perfectly nice handbag that you can use day to day and not worry about getting mugged for, it just doesn't make sense to me. Anyway, that's something I think that not everybody, but a segment, a section of society might consider that that's their aspirations and that's what they need to make their life complete. A designer handbag or designer trainers or just designer clothes. They want to show an image of themselves that apparently will impress everybody. But I just think this is a complete waste of time and a waste of money. Number eight is bottled water. I still don't understand why people buy water in single-use plastic bottles. So we're in a situation where we all know we've got too much plastic. Every single piece of plastic that was ever made still exists and yet we're still just making more single-use plastic and it, it just seems like madness to me. In this country we have perfectly safe drinking water I know I'm just, as I'm saying that, I'm thinking, oh my goodness, people in Devon probably don't agree because they've had real issues down there. But generally speaking, we can rely on safe tap water. Our tap water here tastes horrible, I have to say. So what I did is buy a Phlox refillable water filter and it makes it taste much better. But I've never had a water filter before even, but I think it depends on the area. So before I never felt the need for one, but here I really do because it doesn't taste very nice. But bottled water, I just don't, I don't get it. I don't get, get why people buy bottled water when it's good to tap water, as I say, and you can buy really nice reusable water bottles now. Number nine on my list is endless kitchen gadgets. And I am really guilty of thinking I need certain kitchen gadgets and I've invested in them and then not used them. For example, a few years ago, I bought an Instant Pot which I've barely used. It hardly gets used at all. And every now and then I think, I'm gonna start using my Instant Pot and I don't. And it's, it really was a waste of money and I didn't need it. I was kind of, um, I was dragged along by seeing other YouTubers actually using their Instant Pots, thinking, oh, that'd be marvellous. I'll use that all the time. Really haven't. So I've got a bread maker that I don't use either, which I got from my daughter. I did have a bread maker years and years ago and I used it actually quite a lot at that point, but I, I don't hardly eat any bread now, so having a bread maker is a real waste of time. However, one kitchen gadget that I don't regret buying is my Ninja air fryer because I do really use that a lot. It depends, you know, what your lifestyle is, how much time you have for cooking and that kind of thing. I, I still think an air fryer, a decent quality air fryer is actually a good investment because it costs so much money to run your oven now. So that I don't regret that, but I do regret lots and lots of kitchen gadgets that I've bought over the years and not used. Pointless waste of time and money. Number 10, Justin will laugh at this, a pet hate of mine is, do you know those 
plastic fake little shrubby balls and they're, they're literally round and they hang from either side of people's front doors. Have you seen those? I hate those. I think they're plastic. Get some real plants in your garden. I mean, surely a real plant is better than some plastic ball that might look vaguely real for a short while, but soon becomes really faded and just looks like two green plastic balls either side of your front door. And same goes with AstroTurf. I mean, God, why would you want to cover your garden with AstroTurf? It's just plastic when you could actually support some wildlife and have some plants out there. So I don't really get that, like fake plants outside in the front gardens and just, oh, just, why? <laughs> they're made of plastic. They're made of plastic. Everyone knows they're made of plastic. But our wildlife has less and less space to go and thrive. And if we all kept a really good garden, where we've got gardens, and we allowed plants to grow and daisies to grow and wildflowers to grow, then our wildlife would really appreciate it. So plastic grass, plastic shrubs, plastic plants. I just don't get them. I don't get them. I don't understand how they're acceptable in today's society. I hope I haven't offended anybody. And that would have been a good place to end, but because that was 10. But I've got an 11th, which I just don't get this either, is endless fizzy drinks. They're either full of sugar or they're full of artificial sweetener or both, both of which are really bad for your health. And they're in single use plastic nearly all the time as well. I mean, get the odd Coke bottle in glass or you know fizzy drinks in a can which is recyclable but how many of those actually when people are out and about get recycled so endless fizzy drinks I don't I just don't understand cola in particular I don't understand it I really think that it rots your gut it's just really bad for you it must be so bad for your teeth when I discovered that you could clean your toilet with coca-cola and somebody told me that if you put a coin in coca-cola it will come out super clean somebody else said it would actually dissolve altogether i've never tried that i don't know if that's true but something in it that can really really do that kind of clean, deep clean makes me think it's super chemical and, I, and it's not just cola but all fizzy drinks they make you burp they're not good for your digestion they're full of rubbish and they come in packaging that's not likely to be recycled don't get it that's my number 11. so that's my list of things that I don't understand why people buy and I think a lot of the time they are a waste of money. You can save yourself some money by just thinking a little bit about what you're buying and whether it's something that's kind of a pressure from the people around you and society as to why you need to buy them and whether you really, really do need to. And it just kind of changes your way changes your perspective a little bit, I think, when you start asking those kind of questions. Anyway, what are things that you just don't understand why people buy or things that you think are some sort of acquired need? Let me know in the comments below. And if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to give me the thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. Thank you ever so much for watching and I will see you next time. Bye for now.